As the Republican race intensifies between Donald Trump and Ted Cruz, we begin today's show looking at torture, an issue that has repeatedly come up on the campaign trail. In February, both candidates were asked about torture at a debate hosted by ABC. Senator Cruz, is waterboarding torture? Well, under the definition of torture, no, it's not. Under, under the law, torture is excruciating pain that is equivalent to losing, losing organs and systems. So under the definition of torture, it is not. It is enhanced interrogation. It is vigorous interrogation, but it does not meet the generally recognized definition of torture. I would bring back waterboarding, and I'd bring back a hell of a lot worse than waterboarding. Following the Brussels attacks, Donald Trump said torture might have prevented the bombings that killed 35 people. Well, today we begin the show with Eric Fair, who served as an interrogator in Iraq, working as a military contractor for the private security firm Khaki. He was stationed at the Abu Ghraib prison and in Fallujah in 2004. In a new memoir, Fair writes about feeling haunted by what he did, what he saw, and what he heard in Iraq. From the beating of prisoners to witnessing the use of sleep deprivation, stress positions and isolation to break prisoners. In one section of the book, he describes a torture device known as the Palestinian chair. The military describes such actions as enhanced interrogations, but Eric Fair uses another word, torture. He writes, quote, if God is on anyone's side in Iraq, it's not mine. Eric Fair's book is titled Consequence, a memoir. Eric, welcome to Democracy Now! Thank you for having me. Why did you write this? Well, I, after, after about four, well, what are we at, 12 years now of, of thinking about Abu Ghraib um, and, and close to nine years of writing about it, uh, the memories don't, don't go away. Uh, I grew up a, as a Presbyterian in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and part of being a Presbyterian was what we called communal confession. So you arrived on Sunday mornings and you read your confession from a pamphlet, but you read along with, with the congregation. Uh, and that confession was a critical part of, um, of your weekly routine. Uh, as, so as I continued to think about what had gone on at Abu Ghraib and what my own involvement had been and what I had done, uh, it became necessary to confess. And I started with some smaller articles in a number of different newspapers, but um, ultimately produced this book. And could you explain how you ended up going to Iraq? Uh, well, I'd been in the Army. I'd enlisted in 1995, presumably to become a police officer. Uh, I had sensed, again, as a Presbyterian, we, we sense a calling, which often has to do with vocation. Uh, and I had sensed a calling to law enforcement. Uh, the Army was a, was a means to an end for me. This was 1995 through 2000. Um, I ended up at a language school and became an Arabic linguist. But in those years, there wasn't much going on overseas that the Army was involved in. Uh, so in 2000, I took my honorable discharge, and uh, I became a police officer in Bethlehem. About a year, a year or two into that, I was diagnosed with a heart condition, which ended my career. And at this point, the Iraq War was beginning to ramp up. Uh, and as a former soldier and as a police officer and as someone who had been in that community and around those types of people, I felt an obligation. And I'd also supported the initial invasion, so I felt an obligation uh, to be a part of that. Contracting was an opportunity for me to get over there without a, a health, a health uh, examination. So tell us about this company that you contracted with. Well, there were a number of different contracting companies that uh, uh, were looking for just about anybody at that time. The military wouldn't have you because of the heart? The military would not take me as a heart, but there were also a number of positions. Again, the thought, the thought back then was that the war was going to be over very quickly, uh, a matter of weeks, if not months, or, or excuse me, a matter of months, if not weeks. Um, and so the Army didn't think that it had time to train certain positions, to include things like interrogation. Uh, and it also thought that it could save money on things like security and transportation. So uh, the idea was that, uh, that contracted companies like CACI or CACI would come and essentially hire former soldiers who, uh, who had this kind of expertise and this kind of training, bring them over to Iraq to fill in the gaps, and then send us all back home. Well, I'd like to find out more about Khaki, the U.S. private contractor whom you've just spoken about. But first, let's go to a clip from the company's promotional video. Character. It's that unique set of moral and ethical qualities that defines who we are. CACI is built on a foundation of character. For 50 years, our defense, homeland security, intelligence, and federal civilian customers have depended on CACI for world-leading information solutions. They count on us for our character. Honesty, integrity, commitment, respect. Character. It defines who we are. 
Eric Fair, your response to that promotional ad for, for Khaki, the uh, private contractor whom you worked for. And also, could you explain why Khaki, as against uh, the military, didn't require you to take a health exam? Sure. Well, Khaki is an enormous organization. Uh, and this, this contract, this specific contract for interrogation, was a small part of it. I think the vast majority of my colleagues, even if they disagree with what I'm saying now, would agree that the management of khaki employees over in Iraq was a disaster. Um, and well, and lucky it wasn't a physical disaster. Uh, we had uh, vehicles that had been rented from Kuwait that had no armor. We had no medical kits. We had no uh, communication equipment. We had no maps. Uh, and so it was really on the fly. Now, far be it from me to defend, be the one here defending khaki, which, and I write about um, in some detail about, I think, some of their failures. Um, but khaki was an organization, like so many of the other contractors, that was in many ways forced to step up in this war uh, because so few other Americans were joining up. Now, in 2003, something near, n nearly 60 to 65 percent of Americans supported, supported the invasion. I was one of them. And as someone who supported it, I felt an obligation to be a part of it. We, many of us who ended up in Iraq, either as contractors or, or soldiers, were curious about where the rest of that 65 percent of the Americans were. Uh, recruiting offices did not have lines out the doors, and the administration was not calling for people for national service. And so organization, organizations like Khaki either accepted uh, that responsibility or they sort of filled in the holes, depending on, on your perspective. Talk about walking into Abu Ghraib and what you did there. Some of us had heard of Abu Ghraib. There had been uh, a downed American pilot in the first Gulf War who had spent some time there. And so we knew that it was a notorious prisoner in Iraq, but we didn't have a sense, uh, we didn't have a sense that it, it had um, that kind of overwhelming sense of fear for Iraqis. We just thought of it as, as a typical prison. Many of us were former police officers, law enforcement officers. We'd been in prisons. Um, but Abu Ghraib, they, uh, we arrived, they dropped us off, and they left, and they housed us in cells at the time. And there was something in the neighborhood of probably less than 500 American personnel, whether they be troops or, or contractors. There were thousands of Iraqi prisoners. Uh, and so the idea that we were going to interrogate these people and gain any kind of useful intelligence was almost immediately uh, impossible. And what did you see at the hard sites in uh, Abu Ghraib? I spent one day in the hard site. I, as an Arabic linguist, with uh, I'd worked for the National Security Agency, and I, so I had some high-level security clearances. And so the idea was that I would be an effective sort of interrogator in the hard site with what they were calling high-value detainees. Um, the hard site was a, most Americans have seen the have seen the photographs at this point. It was a two-tiered open bay prison, uh, and many many of the uh, of the prisoners, the Iraqi prisoners, were naked, whether they were being forced to stand by uh, being handcuffed to their cell doors or whether they were just sort of uh, being paraded around uh, on the floor, whether they were moving from place to place. Uh, most, I, most of the prisoners either were naked or, or down to their underwear. And what was required of interrogators? Like, what did they want to get from these high-value, so-called high-value target? So the Army puts out what are called PIRs, Priority Intelligence Requirements. Uh, and, and PIRs can cover a variety of different things. They can cover an intersection, a certain intersection that you want to gain intelligence from, or they can cover much larger um, strategic ideas. Now, the, the number one PIR in 2004 was the location of chemical weapons. So every interrogation, on some level, you had to at least address the issue of whether or not this prisoner knew anything about chemical weapons. And again, in 2004, many of us, myself included, were still under the impression that they were there. Um, now, it was clear very quickly that many of the, of the prisoners did not have uh, that kind of information, and so then the PIRs would go down based on whether or not they were part of a, a, uh, an anti-coalition cell or IED emplacement or mortar teams, um, and the idea was that you would fill in the blanks. And how did they decide who should be interrogating these high-value targets? You yourself did not. I did not interrogate high-value targets, and I can't say exactly how those teams were formed. By the time I got there in January of 2004, um, the, uh, the the setup had already been arranged. Um, I was not placed on that team. I was placed on a different team. It was called the FRE team, the former regime elements. Uh, and the idea was to interrogate and debrief people that had worked with, closely with Saddam Hussein. Uh, we're going to go to break. When we come back, I'd like you to read from Consequence, your book, um, using the Palestinian chair on the mayor of Fallujah sure. and what that meant. We're talking to Eric Fair, Army veteran, who worked as a contract interrogator at Abu Ghraib Prison in Iraq, author of the new book Consequence, a memoir. Stay with us.